Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Kat. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, everybody. Um, Thank you for having me. I am... I always have the same experience with uh, being asked to chair a meeting, and it's that when someone asks me to chair, I say yes, and I'm like, yeah, of course I want to speak. Like, I want to be of service, and I want to share my experience with other people, Um, and then the day of, I don't want to speak anymore because my alcoholic thinking has crept in, and I'm starting to think about what you'll think of me, and I'm starting to think about how I have to wake up early, and I'm busy. Um, but then I show up anyway, because I've been taught that our feelings don't matter a lot of the time, and we show up anyway. And, uh, and as a result, I always feel um, more connected to my own program and connected to my higher power. Um, so thank you. And if I'm lucky, um, someone will relate, and maybe I'll even get to, to speak to someone I've never met. So um, thank you for having me. And, and my sobriety date is uh, January 1st, 2013. Um, so I've got five and some change. And uh, it's not my first sobriety date, but I'm really committed to it um, being my last sobriety date one day at a time. Um, And some of the things that I do to make sure that that happens is that I work with a sponsor. Uh, She has what I want. I meet with her every week. I don't cancel. Um, She has me check in with her throughout the week um, via text or phone. And and the reason is so that um, I don't feel like I'm walking through my my daily life alone. And and she knows what's going on so that when I get in front of her, um, I don't have to catch her up on what's going on. Uh, She already knows and we can just get to work and and talk about my step work. And, um, you know, I... I keep my step work at, uh, at the center of, of my world. It's, it's the most important thing that's happening in my life. And the reason is because um, I didn't come to AA because I wanted to have fun. You know, like I love coming to meetings and I look forward to it. And my dearest friends are in this program and the people I look up to are in this program. And it's, it's the center. Um, but the truth is I came to AA because I'm an alcoholic and um, I can't stop drinking when I start drinking. And so I can't pick up a drink ever. Uh, no matter what. And, um, and it's these character defects. It's these stupid character defects that will get me. And um, what I've learned is that they don't go away, right? And so um, sometimes they change, and sometimes um, I'm able to work through a character defect, and it, 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 I, I grow out of it, and then sometimes I adopt a new one, and then I have these ones that are recurring. And, um, and it's okay, but uh, as, long as, um, as long as I'm working this, these steps that are um, laid out so strategically to address these character defects that I have, um, I don't have to pick up a drink ever again. Um, and uh, I'm not going to try to tell you my story um, in 10 minutes, but I will talk about some of the things that I learned in AA that have like just changed my life completely, everything about my life. Um, the first one is uh, that uh, when the solution looks something like the problem, right? So as an alcoholic uh, and, a, and someone that tried to stop drinking on my own for years and years, um, I was a master at trying to solve problems, right? I like made lists of how I was going to stop drinking. I made lists of people that I was going to cut out of my life. I was going to go to more yoga classes. I was going to go to a different bar. Um, I was going to, you know, anything. It was like every week I was making a new list of how I was going to tackle this problem. And that was just alcoholism. I mean, there were all kinds of like problems that I was trying to solve all the time and failing miserably. And what I learned when I got here is that if there's a problem, um, I should do nothing about it. And that was really, really hard for me to swallow is that if there's a problem and I don't know what to do about it, it means that I'm not supposed to do anything. And I'm actually supposed to pray about it. And then I'm supposed to turn to somebody else. I'm supposed to ask them how they're doing. And that was painful because I felt like if I take my hands off this problem, what's going to happen? Like it's going to get bigger. 
if I'm not putting my effort toward trying to fix it, like what's going to happen? It's going to get out of control. Um, and I'll never forget like my very first sponsor, the first time around, I was like 23 years old and, um, and my sponsor, I had like gone through my first like AA breakup and, uh, I was distraught and the world was ending and I was so upset and I didn't want to see him in meetings and I called her and I'm crying and, um, I go through this long spiel of like, I don't know what to do, you know, Jill, what, what should I do? And she's like, I don't know, do the dishes. And I wanted to punch her because to me, I felt like I've just shared all this personal information with you about this problem I'm having and I need help. And you told me to do the dishes and it took a couple years, but now I know why she told me to do the dishes because there's nothing to do when there's a problem. Right. And so, um, and so in the beginning, that was how I prevented picking up a drink, right? It was like, oh my God, all of this stuff is going on. I don't know what to do. In order to not drink, I got to go find a newcomer and ask them how they're doing. And maybe then I won't pick up a drink, right? And now I use that same tool. It's the same tool that I pick up. Um, but it's just when my character defects are taking control and I, and I, um, I don't want to cause wreckage and I don't want to make things worse. And so then I pick up that tool, um, that the solution looks nothing like the problem. Um, one of the other, uh, things that I've learned in AA is that um, giving back is so important and that contributing to my community is huge. Um, I was a bar fly. So I hung out in bars, dive bars all the time. I loved it. Um, and what I would do is I would show up to these bars and I would have expectations and I would want to drink for free and I would want to be taken care of and I would want to ride home and I would want attention and I would have this whole agenda of what was going to happen that night and it never happened. Um, and I would go home feeling irritable and discontent and unfulfilled and I had no idea why. And, um, and, and I got here and I heard that people were talking about service and like they do these things in meetings and for sponsees that, that helps them stay sober. And I kind of felt like it was just fluff and they, and it was like things that people were saying they were doing, but they weren't really doing. Um, and then uh, I started doing them, right? And I started sponsoring people. Um, and I learned that what I had been seeking in bars for like a decade was not what I thought I was seeking. I was seeking some sort of purpose, right? I was seeking to feel a part of something and, and to belong to something that I contributed to. Um, and now I have that in Alcoholics Anonymous. And so while, you know, on a Saturday night, I would have been in a bar, I'm here. Um, but this is a community that I give back to. Um, and that makes me feel like throughout you know, despite having this disease of alcoholism, it's actually tied to like my purpose um, of being on this planet. And when I when I accepted that, it changed the it changed the trajectory of my program and the trajectory of my life, which um, I always like to share in meetings too. Um, <clears throat> what was the third thing? Oh, the third thing um, was to never uh, underestimate the power and magnitude uh, and creativity of my alcoholic thinking. Um, I still have it. It's still there. It's still going. Um, it was going today. And, uh, and what happened with my alcoholic thinking for me was a relapse. So after having some sober time, I had three years and, and some change at the time. And, uh, at about two years, I decided that, um, that I didn't, it was like a kind of a subconscious decision that I didn't really want to work the steps anymore. I didn't really want to be in AA. I didn't want to cut ties. But I had moved away from, like, the fellowship that I got sober in. I had um, a different job. I was in a new relationship with somebody that drank. And um, and I just felt like, well, you know, if it ever comes that I do want to drink or I do get squirrely or whatever, like, I know where the meetings are and I know what the tools are and I've got numbers in my phone and I'll just pick up the tools. And, you know, I don't have to go down that road again. Um the problem with that is that once I'm already uh, considering drinking or I'm, I've already taken a drink, I do not care where the meetings are. I do not care what the tools are, and I don't care. I actually don't care about any of you either, um, which is sad, um, but it's the truth. And, uh, and, and all of a sudden, I'm in alcohol's grips again, like she's back, and, and it, there's nothing that I can really to, do. I'm totally powerless. Um, and so... 
my alcoholic thinking is, is still very rampant. And that, that relapse was two years. Like it wasn't a couple weeks and, um, and I lost a lot and I spent a lot of money. Um, and I lost a job and, uh, that boyfriend that I was with, that I was actually supposed to marry, um, I cheated on him less than two weeks later. And so, uh, I lost everything and it happened really quickly. Um, and so I never underestimate what my alcoholic thinking does. And actually, um, <laughs> so the relationship, it, it, uh, I was in this place with it where, um, you know, I, I would like adored him, but I wasn't in love with him anymore. Right. And so, um, I couldn't figure out how to end the relationship. And, um, and so I thought, well, I can tell him, um, how I feel and I can move on or I can just drink. <laughs> That was my, like, that was my solution to that problem was to drink. Um, and it fixed the problem, I guess, <laughs> if, um, if you look at it that way. But, uh, <clears throat> but yeah, so the alcoholic thinking, oh, the alcoholic thinking is not to be underestimated. And so I don't do that today. Um, for the people that are new, um, if, uh, if you didn't relate to something that I said, you'll probably relate to, to our next speaker. And if not, uh, definitely go to other meetings, find a sponsor, find your people. Um, once those pieces are in place, um, we can get to work. And, and so I hope that you find that if you haven't yet. Um, and, uh, the last thing I wanted to share was something that I was reading today, uh, in the 12 and 12, and I related to it a lot. And I think it was, it's in step 11 about, um, prayer and meditation and self-examination. And, uh, you know, of course this time around, you know, if I had to pick one thing that's different, it's my relationship with my higher power and, um, prayer and meditation and self examination independently are powerful, right? But if we um, interlace them or intermesh them or something, um, that it is, an, uh, it's a design for living that can't be shaken. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I just relate to that so much. And, and I feel like, you know, if I'm in alignment, right, if I'm in alignment with my higher power and I'm, um, I'm meditating, I'm in touch with myself, right, and, and I'm willing to look at myself and my character defects and share them with someone else on a regular basis, um, you can't fuck with me, right? And, and I don't say that with ego, but that's true for all of us. It's like you can't, we can't be shaken. People and places and things don't have to run our lives anymore. And um, and it's just such a beautiful thing, and, and I'm grateful to be here, and thank you. My name is Jacob. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Jacob. Uh, let's see. My sobriety birthday is uh, January 15th, 2012. My um, so I've been sober for six years. I have a sponsor uh, who has a sponsor. Uh, we meet to work the steps. Occasionally, we also talk about my problems. Um, uh, I have a therapist um, who isn't a sober alcoholic, but I take a lot of my... Uh, problems to him now um let's see this is daunting to me like the the idea of 40 minutes so i'm just trying to get figure out where to start um so i i was reflecting today about where like where did like uh alcoholism start for me like where did i like notice it and it's one of my earliest memories was being a kid um i grew up in a very rural part of northern california so we would spend, I mean, I would spend uh, many days in a row, like, alone um, at home. I would maybe see my parents, maybe see my siblings, um, and I loved it. It was like, uh, it was heaven to me. I didn't have any problems because there was nobody around to give me any problems. But I remember this one day, um, my dad came home from the grocery store, and he brought, like, a box of old-fashioned powdered donuts, and I, he was like, you can have one. And so I had one and he, he like left to go to work or whatever. I ate a donut. And then by the end of the day, when my dad came back home, I had eaten all of the donuts. <laughs> and I remember each time I went to get a donut, I was like, I'm not supposed to be doing this as I was like consuming this thing that made me feel different. Uh, that was like a nice secret, like bad thing. It was like a small kind of like a mean thing I could do against the world too. Like, that was a donut that, like, somebody who wanted a donut didn't get to have now. Um, and uh, and then, you know, I, my dad came home, and I, I got in a lot of trouble, and that, that was, like, an entitlement. Like, that right there was, like, okay, so, like, this grudge against the world is correct because I'm being punished for something that, you know, I didn't have this language at the time. It was mostly just, like, fuck you, dad, um, uh, which became, like, my mantra. But um, there's a lot of dads in the world. 
Um, yeah, so, so yeah, that's like, I don't know, to me, like, that's my earliest memory of, like, powerlessness. And when I think about my drinking history, um, it really fits that, that, that thing. You know, there were a lot of times, um, you know, when I was drinking, when I was trying to have a nice life instead of just having a drinking life, um, like, uh, I, I, you know, I have like a girlfriend, we would probably live together in her apartment. Um, I had like a part-time job typically involving alcohol somehow, um, you know, allowing me easy access to pilfering it. Um, and it would be a lot of like, it'd be like five trips to the, the corner store, uh, in an evening. And each time it would be like a little, you know, it'd be like a little more, uh, enthusiasm on my end. You know, this'll be, now this'll be like the last, uh, the last, uh, 22 ounce beer, you know, for the night. Um, and then there were like, it progressed from that. It was, it was, it was really good. Um, starting this meeting with more about alcoholism for me because my drinking, uh, was always interrupted by these like brief moments of sobriety. I would, um, create a lot of wreckage in other people's lives. And then the easiest thing I could do to not have to show up to fix it was to just stop drinking, um, for like a month. I'd be like, Oh yeah, I'm just not drinking for like 30 days. You know, I just got to get my shit together try to get another job, you know, get a haircut, um, and I'll be good. And then, uh, you know, it'd be like 30, 60, 90 days, um, always without a program. It was always white knuckling it. Um, maybe, maybe having like one or two people trying to support me while I was doing it. Um, mostly I kept them around to function as like apology for me and like the friend group I was currently ruining. Um, uh, I'm just being honest. I'm sorry. I know this is like really ugly. It took a lot of work to be able to talk about myself this way. Um, I used to, like, I didn't know that that was what I was doing. You know, it was, I was completely oblivious. Um, and yeah, uh, it was always, the relapses were always, it was always worse. Like, uh, it didn't always get worse right away. Sometimes it actually got better. I would start drinking and people would be like, yeah, I forgot how like nice and funny you are when you're drinking, uh, for a little bit. Um, and then it would, it would start becoming consequences. And then after consequences that I didn't show up for, it would just be wreckage. Um, I'm like a musician. Uh, I had like some other interesting things. So I got to leave town a lot. Like if, uh, if I blew something up so bad that it scared me, I could just disappear. Um, you know, like if I got caught stealing from somebody or, um, like whatever, I could just go to another town, um, and try again. And, and for me, that was always, that was always the thing. Like I always had this really like pure intention. It's like, I'm just, I'm really trying to get it together this time. You know, I've been really talking a lot about going to community college. Um, but nothing ever materialized. It was always like just enough of a foundation to convince people I was stable so that I could start to drink the way I like to drink and then become dependent on them when the foundation gave way and then make them suffer me when I was drinking the way I like to drink. Like I would show them sort of, um, you know, what I was really about, that it wasn't a party. It wasn't fun. I wasn't a rock star. I was, I was a fucking drunk. I'm swearing a lot in a church. I feel bad about it. Um, <laughs> I was a drunk and it was a problem and I didn't know how to fix it. I didn't have a solution and I didn't feel like I could ask for help. Um, I felt like I deserved the life that I had to live. Like I was doomed and it was appropriate. Um, so what, what happened, that was, that was like the formative years. That was, uh, you know, er, late teens, early twenties. Um, and I moved to Portland. I moved in, uh, with some people I had known for about three weeks. Um, these, you know, these, these, these punk kids and they were like, we're starting a punk house. Um, you know, it's $250 a month for the biggest room in the house. And I was like, I'm fucking there. Uh, I moved in, you know, got a part-time job, you know, was barely scraping by. And I, I remember having that feeling that was like, these people drink the way that I like to drink. Um, I walked out of my room after my, the first night I stayed there, uh, I had blacked out around 10 o'clock in the evening. I showed up at eight. I'd blacked out by 10. They said I, I was up until the sun came up drinking with them. Um, in my underwear swinging from the rafters in the garage with the chainsaw. And then I walked out, they were telling me the story and I had finished off like this, like warm, flat 40 ounce that I had in my bedroom, like shamefully, like it was a secret that I was drinking right after waking up. And I went out to the garage to smoke with them and, and find out how bad it was. 
and uh, they were all drinking. And I was like, this is fucking perfect. Like, I don't have to hide my, like, my morning drinking anymore. Um, I just get to party around the clock. And it was a lot of fun. And I'm still really good friends with one of the people from that house. Um, I mean, we're really good friends who don't talk right now. But we're really good friends. <laughs> we just Instagram with each other sometimes. Um, but it's cool. Uh, yeah, so, so through that, you know, I decided... Um, I'd been living in that house for about seven months, which was about the amount of time I could I could put into the same group of people before I got to the point where I had to bail. And uh, everything had just fallen apart. Um, I was stealing money out of the cash register at my job. I was stealing uh, beer every day. I was drinking um, in the cooler. I would lock the door at the convenience store I worked at and go drink in the cooler. and be like, oh, yeah, I dropped some beers and I had to throw them away. So uh, that's why they're gone. And uh, uh, food, I stole a lot of beef jerky for a V, and it was really weird. Um, I don't know. Uh, it doesn't make sense still. Um, and it was just like a nightmare. Like, I could tell that, like, something was, like, around the corner. Like, there was, like, this feeling of, you know, something was coming for me, which had been there most of my life. Um, and so I decided to go live a life of crime with a friend of mine. Um, and we, like, dropped out. It was a lot of, like, uh, begging... Uh, homelessness uh, it was marginally voluntary. That the thing that made it voluntary was that I said, I, I like said yes and had some time to prepare. Uh, like I got a sleeping bag and a pack, but um, yeah, it was really ugly. It was really, it was really hard. I, I traveled a lot in that time. It was a lot of like uh, trespassing, hitchhiking, riding freight trains, um, just constantly terrified every day that today was going to be the day I got really familiar with jail and getting arrested. I got to the point where I was like, I just don't, I don't talk to cops anymore. I just show them my ID and like put my hands out and fucking, you know, whatever, dude, it's another ticket. I'm not going to pay. It's just a warrant in 60 days. Um, yeah, it was, it was really bad. Uh, there was a lot of like really traumatic events, like physically violent, um, meeting people who were way more about that life of crime than I was. Um, and learning that like, uh, it was just a bad fit. Like it wasn't gonna, uh, it was really unsustainable. So this whole time I also had a bleeding ulcer that was hemorrhaging like a couple times a week. Uh, so I was drinking, mostly getting my calories from Pepto-Bismol and, uh, malt liquor. Um, and yeah, I was just really fortunate that it all came crashing down. I couldn't even be a bum. Um, try as I might, like I couldn't make that work. And, uh, I was really lucky. I met some people, imagine that who were going to help me get my life together. Imagine that. Uh, it wasn't AA. It was like this, it was this unaffiliated group of individuals who just like cared about people for some reason. Uh, they were all sober and they helped me, you know, they helped me, um, stop drinking and sort of figure out what, like, what were my next steps going to be? Um, and I, I couldn't really like imagine, like, like what, what was I going to do for money, you know, other than like scam Walmart for 40 bucks or, um, you know, try to like strong arm somebody, uh, for like cash outside an ATM. And, uh, I just had really low ambitions and I, I reached them all, like all these benchmarks. Um, I was like a dishwasher at a restaurant within like two months and I was like, hell yeah. Like I work in the service industry. This is sick. Um, and I love, I have absolutely like so much love in my heart for the service industry. Like it did, it kept me sober cause it gave me something to be more angry at than I was angry at myself for, um, I became like the line cook. I'm really, I'm a really good cook. Uh, it turns out I had a lot of really amazing opportunities, um, that I sabotaged with like this really shitty attitude. Um, I like did like the first year I was sober, I was like, um, oh, the problem is that I've tried to be monogamous, so I'm going to be polyamorous. And I was like, uh, just dating all the time and never having to think about how I was feeling or like what, like I was really honest, but I just didn't fucking know. So I was just telling the truth about very little because there was so little that I could actually be in touch with. Um, and I was like always just so fixated on this other person being like that, like you were going to fix me. Like I was going to care enough about you that like you were going to, you were going to step in and like all of the weird, like broken, like burnt wires in my fucking head were going to get removed. Um, and I was going to have like, I was going to be like restored 
somehow. Um, and it never worked out. You know, it was always this unreasonable demand and always just more wreckage. And I, I learned, I learned a lot and I had to learn it really slowly. And it was characterized by a significant amounts of pain. Um, like there were so many, so many moments where I was like out front of a liquor store, pacing back and forth, talking to myself out loud about what was going to happen if I, if I went in and got a beer, got a bottle. Um, and I, I did it all on my own and it was, I stayed sober that way for three years. I had a really small world. I worked and I yelled at people, um, who I didn't work with and some people who I did work with. And I had like enough language, like enough of this kind of appropriate, like soft emotional language that I could say things like I'm, it's really difficult for me to like process conflict with other men with like a guy who I have by the collar against a wall. Like that's not um, processing. That's like assault. Um, and it was like, it was weird because shit did slowly, you know, things were getting better. I was getting results. So it seemed like I needed to stay sober. It seemed like staying, like the alcohol was really the problem. Um, you know, and that, and that not drinking was what the solution was. And then, you know, the, the ground zero day happened where this lady I had dated didn't text me back about us getting coffee to talk about um, how the relationship had ended. And it just sent me into a rage. Like, I completely lost my shit. Um, I had this kind of fancy kitchen job. I, I had a couple. Um, I was working, like, 80 hours a week at that time. And uh, I had, like, I was, like, 40 pounds lighter and was doing, like, cool vegan CrossFit. So I had, like, uh, internet followers. And I was, like, in this community that seemed really conscious and caring. Um, and that is for a lot of people. Um I had like all of these things that I, I really, like I tried so hard to value and, um, and it just didn't matter anymore. I was done. I was like, fuck it. Like this was my best attempt at living and it wasn't good enough. And I was marching down Piedmont Avenue. Uh, this was 2015, like kicking at cars and I, like storming off. I, so the other part of this is I was going to Al-Anon at this point cause I was convinced that you guys were my problem, that I wasn't my problem, but alcoholics were my problem. Um, cause there's a lot of them in my life. Um, so there are no al meetings during the day, uh, during the week because they're probably at work. So, uh, <laughs> but there was a double winners meeting at central office. So I walked from Piedmont Avenue down to central office with this huge fucking chip on my shoulder and, uh, and the door was locked and, uh, and this guy came out from like a different, which what I know now is not anything related to AA. And he said, uh, he was like, oh, they're closed, they're fumigating the building. But uh, there's a three o'clock meeting at, at Rockridge Fellowship on Piedmont. And I like, I had this feeling like I was like, this is the guy I'm going to blow up on. Like this, this is the one that'll like, I can start this like, this death march. And um <laughs> And that was just immediately, like, removed from me. It was, like, the funniest thing. I heard the suggestion. And then the part that was even crazier is I decided to take it. Um, and I walked back to Rockridge, and I sat down in the back row, like, my phone, like, so mad at, like, everybody there. And people started talking about things that I had been living with my entire life that I had not told fucking anybody. Like, people were talking about fears that they had, um, like anxieties, uh, the way that we characteristically experience depression, um, the grief that we feel for the way that we live, um, the guilt. And I was, like, completely blown away. And I raised my hand and I said, my name's Jacob. I'm an alcoholic. I've been staying sober on my own for three years and I need help. And I started crying. <laughs> And uh, this guy came up to me after the meeting, and he stuck his hand out. And he said, I'm Brian. You want to get coffee and talk about the steps? And I said, get the fuck away from me. And he <laughs> stormed out of that meeting like, so quick. I was like, no. Um, and I, like, you know, I went to some people who were, who were really close to me, and I started talking about it. I was like, I can't do this anymore. Like, it's just not working. I told them what was really happening. Like, I let... I finally let people know. Again, you know, I was as honest as I could be with about as little as I knew. 
And it, it just got more support. And so I started going to Rockridge, and people suggested that man who I had said no to uh, every meeting I went to over the course of a week. And so finally I took his number one day and gave him a call. We started working the steps together. Um, and I lied to him every time we talked about my life. I did not give that man uh, a single chance to help me. Uh, he told me I had to do a fourth step, and he told me what it was. And I made people up. I made resentments up against my family. Uh, and I didn't mention the ones that I actually had. Um, I was like, oh, yeah, Jesus, this is like, so helpful. I feel fucking, like, so really, I just feel so different, you know? Um, I was, like, co-opting the language, uh, the spirituality. I was co-opting, like, the identity. And I was holding these things like objects before me. And they were just more defense mechanisms. Like, they were more things that kept you from getting anywhere fucking near me. Um, and especially with him. And, uh, you know, he, he relapsed the day that I was supposed to read him my fifth step. We still met up, um, or it was the day before I was supposed to read him the fifth step. So the day I still read him my fifth step, he told me I needed to find a new sponsor. Um, but he said, you know, like it says in the big book, if you've done a fifth step, you know, you spend that hour alone in, in quiet contemplation. And I didn't even get a block away from his house. And I called him and I said, I, I, I'm sorry. Like I made all this shit up. Like I, I haven't been working the steps. Um, and like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try to do it different and thank you for your time uh, and your help. When I went to a meeting and I sat in the front row, uh, again at Rockridge fellowship and, um, I raised my hand. I was the first person to share at that meeting. And I said, my name's Jacob. I've been bullshitting my way through the steps and it's not working. I'm scared of what's going to happen and I need a sponsor. And the secretary stood up at the end of the meeting. He stuck his hand out. He said, my name's Bob. You want to get coffee and work the steps? And I said, yes. Um, I cry when I talk about Bob. Um, <laughs> I, I had to read parts of my step work to Bob with like my fists up, like ready. Like he was holding the notebook while I was ready to hit him in case it got that bad. Like it was so... It was so scary, and it continues to be something that comes up where there's a part of me that holds on to things that really matter, that I really value, um, and I, I cannot share them easily with other people. Um, but what I know, like what my experience has been and where my faith lies today in this program is that the things that don't serve me become removed from me. Um, when I talk about them with another alcoholic, um, you know, when I work with other alcoholics, uh, as a sponsor to them. Um, when I try to live the principles of this program, like when I'm in a situation that's questionable and I could, I could act like an asshole and get what I want right now, you know, like I can use my, my officer dad voice and like get you to fuck off. Um, or I can try, like I could try something different and see if I get a different result. When I choose that, I'm typically surprised by what the result is. Sometimes it takes weeks for me to realize I even got something that I found that I can appreciate. Um, but another thing that I know through my experience with, uh, with staying sober and working the steps, uh, it's in the big book. Um, and it says that nothing is wasted in God's economy. And, and that always seemed like such a novel idea to me because so much is wasted in man's economy. Um, I was really like taken with that. And what I know today is that like, my experience, like, all of the pain that I've caused other people, all of the pain that I chose to live with and carry with me, um, all of the wreckage that I created with no intention of, of ever uh, showing up to repair, all of the amends I've made that haven't been accepted, um, the amends that I do not get to make to a person's face because to do so would cause them more harm, so they become living amends, um, all of those things serve my recovery. And it might not be something that keeps me sober. Like, I don't get to decide whether or not I drink. That's a decision that's out of my hands today. But what I do know is that that experience might help another alcoholic stay sober if I share it. Um, if I take it with me into my tiny little world and I sequester myself with it, that's the greatest sin I've ever committed. Um, because it, it, it denies the world a chance to find usefulness in it. Um, and I don't know that I deserve the life that I've gotten in this program. I still struggle with believing that. But what I do know is that the people who I've been able to help absolutely deserve the lives that they get. Um, God damn it. <laughs> uh, um, I, 
and like that's that's the thing that really keeps me coming back um you know and it's it's a lot of work that i do in therapy as well like like where is it that this matters to me because it's helping me and where is it that this matters to me because it's helping other people and how do i navigate that like what is it um and i also like i don't get to decide when it's one or the other um and I have moments where I'm just like, you know, like lately I've been experimenting a lot with holding my recovery, like really loosely. Like, I'm just like, let's see what happens. Um, I call it fucking around and finding out. Um, like I've stopped tent stepping every day, uh, like formal tent step, uh, pen and paper. I stopped because I'm not doing that. I'm not texting it to a sponsor or my sponsees anymore. Um, I'm not currently receiving gratitude lists from any newcomers, which is like always been a part of my program. Um, I still meet with my sponsees. I still meet with my sponsor. We've recently gone from every week to maybe twice a month. Um, and it's like, you know, the wheels haven't fallen off of anything yet. Um, but the reason that I feel comfortable doing that is because this foundation that I built in these rooms with all of the work that I've done for so many years is stable enough that I can try to see what recovery looks like in year six. Like it doesn't have to be the same recovery. Because also I wasn't getting results that were going to keep me sober doing the same work over and over again. Um, so I've recently, like, uh, like I have, like, a career that's, like, a real, like, cooking service industry stuff is absolutely a real career. And I'm not um, looking down or talking down on that. But this is something that's sustainable for me um, that I can do that isn't dependent on me, like, uh, hating everyone I work with into yelling at them to be more efficient. Um, and it's really, I have a really difficult job. Uh, that requires like weird obsessive thinking around really precise measurements. Um, and, uh, like a lot of things that really kind of fit into like alcoholic thinking. Um, I have to, I have to constantly be obsessing about three or four things at a time. Um, and, and as a result of this work, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to do, I have new problems. Um, like I have money and I have, I just, my brother just gave me a car because he trusts me to have something like a car. Um, thank you. And, uh, and like, I don't know how to keep these things. Like, um, I have relationships now with people that are based on like a mutual sharing of things that are valuable to both of us instead of me taking and taking and taking and paying lip service to, to supporting them. And uh, these are scary things for, for me. Um, many of them are new and many of them have been really dangerous uh, in the past when I have had things similar to them. So the, the thing that I know is that like when I start to obsess over causes and conditions and how it's affecting me, I'm creating a problem, um, that requires a solution. And when I'm engaged in that, all of a sudden my thinking becomes on like what's appropriate, what's right, what's wrong. How am I going to like comport myself in this? Like what, what is proper, um, you know, behavior. And it, I become very rigid in my thinking. I become very unforgiving of other people and myself, like any, any varying or wavering from the, like the party line is, is unacceptable. And, um, and what the steps have really taught me about, about these new problems that I'm having is that I get to step back from them and recognize them. Like the feeling is like what I want the problem to be. How I feel about this thing that's happening is I really want that to be a problem. It's just a feeling. Um, I'm an alcoholic and I eat a lot of sugar. I'm going to feel different in five minutes. Um, it's just not going to last. So the solution isn't like um, to become, for me at least, it's not to become like entrenched in uh how everything feels to me right now and to engage in this like emotional battleground um because i lived there for a very long time um and i know what it gets me uh which is inevitably drunk uh, if not in jail and instead it's to step back and think like what is you know what what can i do that tends to service um in these situations there's another part that i think about a lot and it's from the sex inventory and the fourth step in the big book um, and talking about a very specific situation, it says, um, you know, we, we pause and, and pray, uh, when we confront the imperious urge, when to yield would mean heartache. And I just take that and apply it to like every part of my life. Cause I'm so fucking soft inside. Like, like I don't get angry first. I, it took a long time to realize that I get really hurt first 
And then to deal with hurt, I get really angry. Um, so like anger isn't a problem I have. Anger is like a reaction to a problem I have. And if I can find a way to like experience things that happen, that bring up feelings, if I can feel those feelings and process them and let them go, um, you know, I'm not going to have to deal with like, how do I not um, punch my boss for talking to me that way today? Like, how do I, how do I like step into a space where like, I like, I just feel like I'm being condescended to by my dad again at, <laughs> at 31 years old. I'm like six again. Um, and like, I got to this point where I can do work that a lot of which takes place outside of AA, it, you know, it happens in therapy um, and other, other 12 step programs because I worked the steps in AA first, like, um, like I wouldn't be here without like every other alcoholic who was drinking themselves to death, um, who found these rooms and the ones who stayed sober long enough to pass it on to other people. Um, you know, like we, we carry this weird sacred lineage, like, uh, like there's no like reset button between that, that third man when the, when the two founders went and found the third alcoholic in the hospital bed, um, and where we're at today, it's, it's like, uh, it's a pretty straight line. Um, and like, I'm getting lost, like I'm on my own ass right now with this shit, but like, if I can just like hold it and like. And just try to pass it on, like the bits and pieces that serve me to other people. Um, then I have faith that, like, whether or not I drank, I did what I was supposed to do. Um, and then, like, that fear of relapse for me gets removed. Um, and I still think about drinking. This is for the newcomer. That shit comes up, and it's insidious. I was in a bad mood about three weeks ago, and I was like coming home, and there's a corner store where I go to get a forty ounce of sparkling water. Uh, almost every night because it fucking soothes me and like some gummy bears. And, uh, and I was like, I could go to that liquor store and get an actual like 40 ounce. And that's a solution to this feeling I have. Like before I had a drinking problem, I had a drinking solution. I felt like naturally incapable of existing in this world. And it felt bad. I felt bad. And I could take something and then not feel bad anymore. Um, and there was a moment where, like, that thinking wasn't academic. Like, it wasn't this cool, insightful, spiritual moment. Like, it was a craving for a drink. And the difference between when that happened and in the past when I would go act on it is that I know that, like, that feeling doesn't require a solution. Like, that feeling's not a problem. If I go make it a problem, then, yeah, that's a problem. But, like, like I just felt bad. And, like, I could go home. I was, like, around the block from my house. I could go home and, um, thank you. I could drink some water and like breathe, pray and like call an alcoholic, text somebody. Like I have all of these tools now where I'm, I'm no longer dependent on like an outside source for my comfort. And I can also like elect to sit in pain. I've learned that like feeling pain serves me. Um, feeling discomfort serves me, um, when it doesn't become unmanageable. Um, and I let, you know, I let other people help me get there. Like when I'm honest about my pain, it's no longer something I have to figure out. So, um, I think, you know, the things that were told to me when I came in here, you know, was get a sponsor, work the steps. If you're in your first, like, if this is your first rodeo or not, and you're new, you know, 90 meetings in 90 days, um, like those things really helped. And things that I suggest to sponsees are like, if you're new, Get a, other newcomers' phone numbers who have less time than you um, and, and, and talk to them about their lives because it's the guy with two days who shows the guy with one day how to stay sober. Um, and, like, when we can shift our thinking towards service, like, we stop thinking so much about ourselves. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.